Welcome to lecture number 22. In this lecture, our topic of discussion is NOC router microarchitecture. Last lecture, we have seen how basically a network on chip framework works and we have seen about routing and various topologies. Today, our focus is more on how will you make sure that a packet that from one particular router is reaching the adjacent router, what are the kind of handshake mechanisms between adjacent routers and what is the internal organization of an NOC router. We have seen the building blocks of network on chip as topology routing, these are the two things which we have already covered and we will now focus on what is flow control and what is router microarchitecture. The concept of flow control means an upstream router should know the buffer availability of a downstream router. So, what do you mean by upstream router? When a packet is moving from 13 to 14, then 13 is called upstream router and 14 is called a downstream router. So, what it tells is the upstream router should know the buffer availability of downstream router. Any router which is going to forward a packet should know whether there is a buffer that is available in the next immediate router that is a successor router and credit should be exchanged between routers by handshake signals. So, how will you get it? 14 should have a feedback mechanism by which 14 will communicate the number of buffers available with it so that 13 will know how many packets I can send. Similarly, once the packet reaches 14 then as far as this packet is concerned when it moves from 14 to 10, 10 is the downstream router and 14 is the upstream router. Similarly, 10 will become the upstream and 6 will become the downstream. At every point, every router will have a credit channel through which information pertaining to availability of buffers is being communicated. So, when there is a case that you just imagine you have a block at the, the router number 6. Now, when you have a block at the router number 6, how how generally a block happens? If the buffers are full in 6, then 6 is in a position where it no longer can accept new packet from 10. So, when there is a block in 6, it is going to tell to 10 that my buffer is full, you cannot send anything. So, over a period of time, packets that is coming from 14 will get accumulated in 10 and 10's buffer will be full, that scenario will happen and then send 10 is going to say that do not send any more packets to 14. So, packets that will reach in 14, 14's buffer will be full and 14 communicate back to 13. This mechanism by which the buffer availability status or buffer fullness is being communicated back all the way to the source is called back pressure technique. So, you should know that every router in all its input direction from north, south, east and west, whenever packets are coming, we first they are going to reside in the buffer. So, before sending a packet from one router to another, checking of availability of buffers is a must. So, flow control plays an important role in ensuring the smooth exchange of packets from one router to the downstream router with the help of efficient handshaking mechanisms. Now, let us see how a packet is moving from one router to another. We have learned in the flow control technique that there should be a handshaking mechanism wherein adjacent routers know each other what are their capabilities in terms of storage. Now, how are the packets going to move? What is the granularity at which these packets are going to move? That is what is why we are going to learn. Our conventional networks, traditional computer networks use store and forward switching mechanism. You receive a packet fully, store it, perform error detection and correction and then once everything is fine, then from that router to the next router, you are going to forward the packet. That is called the store and forward packet switching scheme. We will try to understand what is store and forward and then we will take it forward. What are the specialized kind of switching that is being used in network on chip routers? So, store and pack forward packet based flow control is a conventional one used in traditional computer networks. Now, in this case, packet is copied entirely into the network router before moving into the next node and flow control unit is basically your packet. So, the entire packet move from one router to the next router only after successfully receiving the entire packet it is been forwarded to the next downstream router. So, consider the case wherein you have to send four 
uh, this a packet which consists of four flits from S to D. If it is a store and forward switching, then this is going to lead to high per packet latency. We will see why. But it requires buffering of the entire packet in each node. So, even though a packet is divided into four smaller units called flits, only if all the flits reaches the next router, then only it is going to be forwarded. So, you have the first flit coming, second flit coming, third followed by fourth. Only at this point, this packet is now completely stored. So, packet is copied entirely into the network router before moving into the next one. And then the next step wherein all the flits are being moved. And then finally, from there it is going to reach the destination. That is a mechanism by which store and forward switching works. Because of this, every router need to have capacity wherein it can store the entire packet. So, if the packet size is going to be 20 flits, the buffers should have 20 flit capacity. Now, we know that packets are broken down into smaller flits and flits are sent across fabric in a wormhole fashion. This is the switching techniques or the flow control techniques that has been employed in network on chip. So, we divide the packets into smaller flits that is what the concept we have known and they are consists of head flits, then you have body flits and then at the end you have tail flits. So, head flit, body flit and tail flit constitute your total packet and the body flits will simply follow the head flit and tail follow the body flit and the movement is pipelined. So, if the head flit is blocked, the rest of the packet stops and routing that is source and destination information is all available only at the head. So, we will try to understand this concept. You have a packet which is further subdivided into smaller component called flits. The first one is called head flit which has lot of control information especially what is the source address, destination address, sequence number or any other parameter. Now, the head flit will move. The head flit is going to reserve a buffer for the remaining body flits and head flit need not wait there like what we have seen in store and forward packet switching mechanism where the entire packet needs to reach a router in order to move forward. Here there is no such restriction as and when output packet or output port is available and there is buffer availability in the downstream router, every fleet is free enough to move to the downstream router. So, head fleet may move, in the meantime body fleet may come or if you look at it, any snapshot or any window, the different fleets of a same packet will be present across multiple routers and this concept is known as wormhole routing. If you look at the diagram that is given here, you can see that the head flit has already reached here and the two body flits are in adjacent routers and the last tail flit is in a different router. The advantage here is the buffering capacity of each of the router need not be equal to the size of a packet. We are never enforcing that all flits of a packet should reside inside the same router. So, even if we have a buffering which is one or two flits, still the whole concept will work. And this lead to lower latency of the packets because we are not at all being blocked until your tail is going to reach. As and when the head finds a way to move further, the head moves. Similarly, every body flit also moves like that. So, this is an efficient buffer utilization without having the entire packet buffers, we can still manage easy forwarding of the flits. And generally, a packet occupies resources across multiple routers. Now, let us try to understand another important concept, it is called head of line blocking. So, think of a case that since we told we have buffers, consider the case that you have four directions, let us say north, south, east and west and we got flits that are residing inside these input buffers. Now, let us imagine these are the four different output ports where 1 indicates north, 2 indicates south, 3 is east and 4 is west. The numbers here indicate what particular direction or which is the direction that each of these flit is looking for. So, here you have the first flit in the queue is looking for output port 4, whereas here the first flit is looking for output port 4. In this case, this flit is looking for output port 2 and here we have the very first flit looking for output port 1. Now, look at the scenario what happens? You have two front flits, the first flit in 
input port number 1 that is this and the first fillet in input port number 3 both are competing for the same output port 4. We know that only one can be granted the other one has to wait. But whereas in this case there is only one candidate looking for 2 and one candidate looking for 1. So, this can directly go to 2 and this can directly go to 1. We can see that nobody is able to move to output port 3 because we we do have flits which require output port 3, but they are not in the front of the queue. So, this is known as head of line blocking. One of these four is actually not allowing a flit which actually want an output port, but because of the organization it cannot be done. So, generally this kind of buffering will suffer from head of line blocking. If head flit cannot move due to contention, another worm cannot proceed even though links may be idle. Let us try to see with the help of an illustration how head of line blocking really happens. Think of a case that you have a scenario wherein this particular green packet cannot move because there is a block there. Now imagine you have these set of flits which is marked by blue color. You have four flits which constitutes a packet P1 whose destination is this blue and your red color four flits of them are now residing inside a queue whose destination is this. So, this is the scenario the blue ones wanted to go to this point and the red ones wanted to go to this point. Let us now try to see what is head of line blocking. So, the blue packets are coming fleet by fleet and they are going to occupy. So, here you can see that one blue has occupied. Now, this buffer is full. So, because of the buffer is full the blue cannot proceed over there. So, naturally due to the back pressure mechanism blue is getting accommodated in this router. So, the subsequent blues will come and then followed by the red is coming, but the red's destination it has to go straight. The channel is idle, but the red placket is blocked because it is occupying after blue in this queue. All other reds will come subsequently come over there. So, now the red hold this channel, the channel remains idle. So, because of this even though the channel is idle it cannot move and this scenario is known as because the blue is residing there, the blue cannot move because of that the red which occupies after blue is getting blocked. This is called head of line blocking. So, even though the red wanted to move in this direction, the buffer is free, the link is free, but my predecessor is blocking me. The solution for head of line blocking is virtual channel flow control. So, what we do is multiplex multiple channels over a single physical channel. So, generally what we have is the limitation what we have addressed now is when you come through a link when you are going to enter into a router you have a FIFO queue you can see that a set of fleet buffer space is being organized as a queue. So, FIFO buffers are replaced with multi line buffers. So, what we generally do is divide up the input buffer into multiple buffers sharing a single physical channel. So, you can see that when a fleet comes you are using a demultiplexer using which the fleet will either reside here or reside here. So, depending on the output direction or depending on the packet number we are providing multiple virtual channels. So, this is known as a physical channel you have many physical channels the point at which it enters the router it is being split across multiple channels they are called virtual channels. So, even though one of them is blocked the other one which may come after this one can still move further. So, we are avoiding head of line blocking and each one virtual channel will be accommodated by fleet of one packet. Similarly, this virtual channel will be accommodated by fleets of an another packet. So, even though let us say this is P1, flits of P1, flit of P2. Assume that flits of P1 reach this router before flits of P2, but if the output direction for P1, let us say it is this, this is for P1, but if it is a block there, that means there is no buffer availability in the downstream. But if P2 wanted to go in this direction where there is buffer availability, P2 will move out first. So, this will avoid head of line blocking. Now, coming into virtual channel flow control what we have seen the physical channel which terminates at the end of for buffers 
is now been divided into multiple lanes, multi lanes which is known as virtual channels. Virtual channels are allocated once at each router to the head fleet and remaining fleets of the packet inherit the same virtual channel number. So, this may be the head fleet and these are body fleets of the same packet. <coughs> so, whatever you see for example, if this is VC0, let us say this is VC1, then VC2, if VC0 is assigned to one particular packet, all fleets of the same packet will come and reside inside the same virtual channel. Fleets of different packets can be interleaved on the same physical channel. So, if you look at here, it can be fleet 1 of packet 1 that is going followed by fleet 1 of packet 2 followed by fleet 2 of packet 2. It can be then fleet 2 of packet 1 like that in whatever interleaved order it comes as long as it know which, which virtual channel they should go and sit the problem is resolved. So, it will eliminate head of line blocking and it makes sure that all fleets of a particular packet are being organized systematically. These virtual channels will avoid deadlocks. So, now we will see how virtual channel flow control happened the same scenario let us imagine that there is a block over here due to non availability of buffers in this particular router. Now, you have blue packets or fleets of blue packet which is looking for this as the destination and fleets of red packet which is looking for this as the destination. So, the blue is coming and then blue getting blocked. So, imagine that this buffer is full. So, buffer full blue cannot proceed. So, the blue is getting stocked at this point. So, all the subsequent fleets of blue will come and reside there. Now, your red is coming. So, red will sit in a different virtual channel. So, now you can see this is virtual channel 0 and this is virtual channel 1 and we know that red came after blue, but red is to a different destination. So, red is going to move further so that it will reach the destination. So, even though blue is blocked there, blue is not allowing to block the red. Hence, virtual channels will help us to avoid head of line blocking and enable smooth transition of packets from one router to another. So, this is the general layout of a TCMP structure where we have processing elements connected by a grid of routers. Now, we will see what is there inside the router. The routers as buffers which are generally called as virtual channels and we have physical channels which terminate these are all the physical channels connecting to the neighbor. So, the physical channel is getting terminated on the virtual channels and we know that the purpose of a router is to connect or is to forward packets from input direction to output direction. So, there is a crossbar which connects the input to output and then we have a control logic which facilitates the forwarding of the packet from one input to another. There are basically three components for the control logic. One is the routing unit, second one is a virtual channel allocation and the third one is the switch allocation operation. We will now examine what are the functions of a router. We all know the routers are going to be the single point of entry for data from a tile into the network. Now, apart from handling the packets of the source tile, the routers also act as a shared resource for all other tiles because their packets are being carried through this router. So, there is an intelligence that is available in the router. This router should intelligently find out what is the source address and destination address of the incoming packets and how to do processing on it, sometimes forward them and sometimes deflect them, we will see what are the functions of the router. The first and foremost function of a router is for every incoming fleet, I need to first buffer them. So, we make use of the virtual channels to buffer them. The second operation is root computation. Root computation is the process by which for every incoming fleet, we have to find out what is the output port. The process of finding out an output port for every incoming packet is called root computation. Next operation is called virtual channel allocation. We know that a packet upon reaching a router is first placed inside these buffers known as virtual channels. Similarly, if a packet that is residing in one of the virtual channel after performing the routing, it need to reserve a buffer in its downstream router. So, the downstream router is here from the downstream router, I need to get a feedback mechanism by which I will know which of the virtual channel is free. The process of reserving a buffer in the downstream router is known as virtual channel allocation. We now move on to switch allocation. Switch allocation is a process. Imagine that 
you have this particular fleet which resides in VC0 is looking for south direction. Similarly, a fleet it is swimming in VC0 of the processing element that also wanted to move to the south direction. So, if two fleets are trying for a common output port, then we need to resolve the conflict, one has to be picked. So, when multiple fleets compete for the same output port, the winner is chosen by a switch allocation algorithm. So, first the fleets will come and stay in the buffers, perform the routing, find out the output port. In the neighbor corresponding to that output port, a buffer has to be reserved in the downstream router and then you have to win the switch. If there are multiple parties that is looking for the same output port, you have to choose the winner. Once you are winning it, then you are traveling through the crossbar switch. That is the process by which I travel through the crossbar switch. And then at the end, we have the link traversal. Once you cross the crossbar, then we are ultimately landing up in the link. So, these are the functions that happens inside the router and this is happening outside the router. So, it is basically a link operation. Let us see. These are all five independent operations that we have seen, buffer write, root compute, virtual allocation, switch allocation and switch traversal. And this can be done in a pipeline fashion. So, we call it as a router pipeline. The simplest of pipeline is a five stage logical pipeline where you have a buffer write operation independent of root computation operation which also is independent of virtual channel allocation, switch allocation and switch traversal. So, it is a five stage router that we have seen. Now, can I pipeline it? So, I perform the buffer write operation for the head fleet. In the very next cycle, I will get the body fleet. So, that buffer fleet. So, in each and every subsequent cycle, I am performing the buffer write. When I am performing buffer write of the body fleet or writing the body fleet into the virtual channel, the head fleet undergoes root computation. Once the head fleet undergoes root computation, it goes to virtual channel allocation. That also will be done only for the head fleet. And then we have switch allocation, switch traversal and link traversal. Virtual channel allocation and route computation, these two operations are done only for the head fleet. So, during that time, the body fleets will not do any operation. Now, if you can see that the link traversal and the switch traversal happens in a pipeline fashion. When the head fleet is performing the switch traversal, the body fleet is been going through switch allocation. When head fleet is traveling through the link, First body fleet is performing switch traversal, the second body fleet is performing switch allocation. Like that if you look at here, in every cycle, one one fleet is traveling through the link. This is possible even though each of the fleet has to go through 5 different cycles inside a router, because of the pipeline operation, we get better throughput. Root computation is performed only once per packet, virtual channel allocation also is done once per packet and that is done only on the head fleet. Body and the tail fleets inherit this information that is the route computed for a head fleet and the virtual channel allocated for a head fleet and they have been simply followed in the case of a body fleet and tail fleet. Now, let us see what are the dependencies. If you decode what is there in the head, then only you can perform routing. Only if the routing is over, then only I can perform virtual channel allocation. If the routing tells that your output is south, then I have to look into the south neighbor and find out whether there is a buffer available or not. That is the dependency between them. Now, if I perform virtual channel allocation, that means for a fleet, there is a buffer that is available. If there is a buffer available, all those fleets who got successful buffers reserved in the downstream router, they only participate in switch allocation. And if those who got switch, they can only traverse through the crossbar. So, the dependency is I can perform virtual channel allocation only if the routing is over. Similarly, if switch allocation can be done only if the VC allocation is over. Similarly, I can travel through crossbar only if I am allocated with the switch. So, dependencies between output of one module and input of another is been shown in this diagram. So, this shows the critical path through the router. So, if I tell what is the total processing time in the router, it is a time from this point to that point. That is a time what I am talking about. So, if I wanted to reduce the amount of time a packet is spending in the router, then each of these component, if we try to reduce, we will get. So, they are all basically in the critical path. Meaning, you cannot bid for switch port until the route is been performed because of these dependencies. Now, there is something called look ahead routing. 
at current router you perform the route computation for the next. So, you can overlap buffer write with the root computation. So, pre computing route allow fleet to compete for VCs immediately after the buffer write. So, by this process I am performing the buffer write at the same time I am performing the root computation because of that immediately after that I can perform virtual channel allocation. So, the root the root computed is decoded into the header and routing computation needs to be done at every hop and can be computed in parallel with VA as well. So, this is called the speculative routing where virtual channel and switch allocation or switch arbitration is done together. So, assume that virtual channel allocation stage will be successful and you are virtual channel allocation and switch allocation happens in parallel. So, this will valid only under low to moderate load. When the load is very high, there is no guarantee that you will get a virtual channel allocated. So, in that case, switch allocation will fail. If virtual channel allocation is unsuccessful, then you are not going to perform the switch allocation operation. So, you perform routing, VC and switch allocation is done parallel and then after that you travel through the crossbar. So, this essentially make it as a three stage router. One cycle for routing, one cycle for VC and switch allocation and one cycle for crossbar traversal. Now, what is the selection strategy? When there are multiple possible paths for a packet in a given router, which one to choose? So, imagine the case that you got a packet that is there at router number 5, what is shown in the diagram. If 10 is a destination, either I can travel through this way or I can travel through this way. So, 6 is a potential neighbor, 9 is also a potential neighbor. So, if both are desired output ports, which is the one that you are going to choose. So, generally from the header, you will know what is a destination. So, the adaptive routing function will return a set of possible output ports. This will tell that east is an output port, north also is an output port. And then based upon congestion, for example, you can try some gather some information that 6 will get number of buffers in 6 and buffer availability of 9 is communicated by 9. So, based upon this congestion information that you obtain from the neighbors, your output selection function will return one output port. So, from many output port, from set of possible output channel, I am choosing one of the channel and that is been done. So, this whole process of collecting the feedback and determining one of the output port is known as output selection strategy. So, now we will just distinguish between what is input and what is output selection strategy. So, consider the case that you have three fleets that is coming. Let us imagine these are north, south, east and west input ports and similarly we have north, south, east and west input ports. So, imagine you got three fleets which has been marked with this green color and if all of them wanted to move through one output port like this, if they, if they all wanted to move through this output port, the green color which of these fleets should be given preference. So, the case is you have three fleets coming, fleet 1, fleet 2 and fleet 3, all of them are looking for same output port. I can permit only one at a time. So, two has to be buffered and then they should try their luck in the subsequent cycles. Which of this packet I will choose that is called input channel selection. Similarly, we will try to understand what is output channel selection. So, imagine that this is north, south, east and west input ports and these are north, south, east and west output ports. So, consider the case that you received a packet which is coming through the east input port reaching an NOC router. Now, upon computation of the route, it was found that it is eligible for travelling through the west as well as travelling through the north. Sometimes you may find more than one output port. So, one packet more than one output port, which output port to choose that is known as output channel selection and we have seen in the previous case when you have multiple fleets looking for the same output port, which one to choose that is called input channel selection. So, now you think you have fleets of different packets, you can see that each of the virtual channel holds only same color, they are fleets of the same packets, here you can see same color. So, this is a logical representation of fleets of same packet occupying the virtual channel router. These are all belonging to different applications and the duty is you have to find out which one to choose here. That is all about the duty of a scheduler. So, scheduling itself is a totally different domain, 
but we stop also discussion with this level as far as the internals of an NOC router is concerned. Before moving on to the next topic, let us try to summarize what we were discussing till now. We started with how a packet is been forwarded from one router to another. So, we are gathering these feedbacks. These feedbacks are obtained from your neighboring routers in terms of credit information. And this handshaking between two adjacent routers facilitate the smooth flow of packets from one router to another. We have seen about virtual channels which will avoid head of line blocking and wormhole routing that is generally employed in network on chip routers. We have seen the internal structure of a router wherein you have a buffer write operation, we have root computation, virtual channel allocation, switch arbitration, switch traversal and then followed by link traversal and we have seen the pipeline the structure of a router also. Our next topic of discussion for today's lecture is application to core mapping. We have seen that we are now our modern processor setups are called multi cores called TCMPs tiled chip multi core processors. We have many cores are there and we have the wide range of applications your WhatsApp is running then Facebook the news feed your compiler program your media application many applications are going to run and now where an application has to be hosted. This is the role played by an operating system. So, how to map applications to core that is called application to core mapping. It is generally done by the operating system which takes a core. Let us say this particular application has to run in this core. This blue application has to be run in this core. So, each has its own merits and demerits. Operating system looks at many criteria in order to perform this mapping. Application to core mapping, generally we have many applications and when you are going to map them, we are going to learn four techniques that generally operating systems follow clustering, balancing, isolation and radial mapping. So, what is basically task scheduling? Then in a traditional microprocessor where there is only one CPU and multiple tasks to be done, there is only one question when to schedule a task that is called temporal scheduling. When you come to many core system where you have multiple processors as well as multiple tasks, there are two aspects when will you schedule a task that is a temporal one and where to schedule a task in which core this particular task has to run that is called spatial scheduling. So, spatial scheduling impacts the performance of the memory hierarchy and latency is impacted by interference in network on chip, memory as well as caches. We have understood these are all shared resource by a processor, you have caches, you have main memory and you have network on chip, all these are shared resource which are working together. So, wherever your application is been running, the performance of network on chip and memory hierarchy is always impacted by the scheduling that you do. I draw your attention to an illustration of an on chip communication. Imagine that your application is going to run here. Now, this particular application and uh, generally your memory controllers, we have learned about memory controllers during DRAM. These memory controllers are placed generally at the corner of the chip, so that the traffic also can be managed. Imagine that, let us say this is the place where the L2 data is available. So, any L1 cache miss will lead to a packet that is being generated, the packet will travel in XY direction or XY routing, reach this particular tile, take the data and then come back. So, an L1 cache miss at the source core will create a network on chip packet which will travel through many routers, reach the destination tile where the L2 cache is being mapped, take a block of data, travel as multiple fleets because your block of data cannot be accommodated in one fleet. So, you have a sequence of body fleets that will carry your cache block, travel all the way return journey in XY routing and reach the source core, fill up the L1 cache block and then continue. Sometimes you can get cases wherein it can be an L2 miss. So, upon reaching the L2 cache only you will come to know it is a miscommunication. So, appropriately the memory address which is been spitted out and you find out based upon certain bits in the physical address which is the memory controller that will help in. So, based upon that you are going and uh, reaching the memory controller where you move off chip, take from the this is the DRAM go to the corresponding row, column, bank and all, get the data, come back, fill up the L2 
and then you reply the generate the reply packet. So, this happens as 1. If I write the sequence of operation, a cache miss is generated, a miss request is going to the L2 tile. Upon checking, it was found that it was an L2 cache miss. So, another request was generated to the appropriate main memory controller and the main memory controller is going to get this request, convert into appropriate DRAM commands, take it off the chip into the DRAM, performs the operation, get the data, fill up the DRAM and then you create a reply packet to the L2 tile. The L2 tile will fill up the block and then go to the L1 cache. That is the order in which on-chip communication happens. Now, let us try to see what is a method by which a clustering happens. Imagine that there is a program that is running in one of the application in a tile. Now, let us say these are the tiles in which the L2 cache misses are been mapped or the L2 is located in these locations. So, during the runtime of a program, we get misses that are being generated to various portions of the chip and then reply packets are also being generated. <coughs> this is an inefficient data mapping because an application that runs somewhere in this sector of the chip has to get data from opposite side of the chip. So, the request all the way how to travel long distances inside the chip it is going to impact the stall time of the application. So, what it does in clustering is, let us say I logically divide the entire chip into 4 clusters based upon its physical location and if the operating system can assign addresses in such a way that everything what this particular application needs can be kept within the same cluster itself. So, packets from this particular core will never move outside this cluster. This method is known as clustering. So, this will improve the locality. Similarly, there is some other application whose cache misses are clustered in cluster 3 itself. This will reduce inter cluster interference, reduced the interference. So, clustering is a technique by which operating system carefully assigns the address because certain bits in the physical address will determine which tile an address is mapped. We have learned it during the time we learned about cache memories of TCMP system. We will work out few problems also in the next tutorial session. You have to understand that it is operating system which assigns a physical address and once the physical address is given, few bits in the physical address will determine where the data is located when it has been placed on chip. So, those, so if the operating system wants a data to locate in a specific tile, then appropriately the bits are to be addressed appropriately physical address has to be assigned. So, one such method is clustering which will improve the locality. Now, we look into what essentially happens in this. You are performing a locality aware page replacement policy. When allocating free page, give preference to pages belonging to the cluster's memory controller. The next one is called balancing. We are going to have various applications. Some applications are been termed heavy in NOC context and some are called as light in NOC context. Heavy applications are those which are going to generate more number of packets in a give, given unit time. The number of cache misses generated by these applications are much higher. So, they are going to create more NOC packets. So, we call them as NOC heavy applications and there are some other applications which will generate cache misses only once in a while. So, we call them as light applications. Now, let us imagine the operating system is going to assign something like this where all the heavy applications come into one cluster and all the light applications move into another cluster. This is not a good approach because this two clusters, this cluster as well as this cluster is handling too much of a traffic. Those routers are working more when compared to the other two routers. These two routers, the routers are having less of job. So, too much load in certain clusters this lead to an imbalance in the amount of network activity that is happening. So, for better life of chip, it is always better to go for a balanced approach. So, the balancing can be something like this. Every cluster will have both heavy applications as well as light applications. Now, we move to the concept of isolation. Here again, we divide applications into medium, heavy and light. Certain applications are called as sensitive applications. 
the prob the peculiarity of sensitive application is these applications upon generating certain misses the application is stalled the rest of the application cannot continue until these misses are being returned this is called sensitive application so generally it is preferred to keep all sensitive application restricted to one cluster this is similar to the concept of let's say if you take the national capital in new delhi the vvip officers the residents of the ministers prime minister they all are probably in a specific area through that maybe the general public travel is not supported so that is what is called sensitive area or vvip area because the traffic between them maybe from the office of one of the minister to the other these traffic movements should not go through the general public traffic so keeping a separate region for sensitive information or sensitive data that is what is known as isolation and then the remaining portion i can fill up with both heavy and light application mix so isolate sensitive applications to one cluster balance load for remaining application across cluster now how will you find out this how are you going to estimate the sensitivity when you have high number of misses for an application and generally it is been measured as mpki misses per kilo instruction and low mlp high relative stall cycles per miss so there are multiple misses we have learned about non blocking caches a cache memory can still facilitate hits even though it is processing a miss but there are can be a case where i cannot proceed to adjacent instruction because i am relatively stalled i am stalled because my previous miss is not at serviced such applications are said to have low mlp memory level parallelism so it has high relative stall cycles stpm an application is said to be sensitive if its mpki is greater than a threshold and the relative stpm is high so this should be high and this is above a threshold value now the question is should we allocate cluster to sensitive application still it is a debatable area these are all people are working on this topic to find out whether to allocate cluster to sensitive applications now let us move into another technique of application to core mapping it is called radial mapping these these classifications are already familiar to you we divide applications into sensitive light medium and heavy and then we have this cores where in the sensitive application is been kept and we try to map application that benefit most from being close to memory controllers we know that if this is going to be the classification of application there is very high probability that the heavy application will move to memory controller more than that of light application heavy application mean there having more of l1 misses the more l1 miss you have the more possibility that you may miss in l2 also so try to keep the heavy applications as close as possible to memory controllers and then little bit medium application and then you have the light application so that these applications which are treated as heavy will get benefit of being closer to the memory controllers and you do for the rest of the clusters as well so with this we come to the end of application to core mapping so apart from the noc router architecture that we discussed today the last topic of discussion was the role played by operating system when you have multiple processing cores available and then you have a lot of applications that is coming how are you going to keep these applications across this cores and application to core mapping is a very important area where an active research is happening this topic is not part of any of the textbook it is published in recent research by some of the leading so research group the whole concept that i wanted to share by teaching you these concept is it's a challenging task when it comes to spatial scheduling of applications we learned about techniques like clustering locality aware page mapping techniques we learned about balancing isolation and radial mapping more problem discussion will be there in the tutorial session that is part of this week kindly refer to the tutorials and the solutions that is been discussed for the numerical questions that is been asked thank you